Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jody Mullen, and this is Alton Gooley. And Hello. Um, we're going to be talking about using toys in play therapy today. But first, um, I'm going to read you a story. And so um, this is called It's Not a Stick, and it's by Antoinette Portis. And um, I would say that there's another book that Antoinette wrote um, called Not a Box. That also would work. Um, for the same kind of theme of what I of why I'm reading this to you. So I'm reading this to you, one, because as adults, we don't get read stories nearly enough. And uh, number two, it's really tied into uh, what we're gonna be talking about today. So um, for your listening pleasure, not a stick. <clears throat> here we go. I'm gonna do my best here. Um, Hey, be careful with that stick. It's not a stick. <laughs> Look where you're going with that stick. Some of you might be like, she's licking her fingers and it, it's COVID. Um, but <laughs> it's my own book, so I just want to say that. Um, <laughs> What stick? <clears throat> Otherwise, I cannot turn these pages. Watch where you point that stick. This is not a stick. Now, what are you going to do with that stick? I recognize this is not very graceful, but it's not a stick. That's my favorite one. <laughs> Don't trip on that stick. I'm telling you, it's not a stick. So standing around with that stick, Stick. This is not, not, not a stick. That one works. Okay, then what is it? So thank you for bearing with me. I just think that's such a perfect way to get started when we're talking about toys in play therapy. I'm gonna pop the um, PowerPoint um, up in the background so that you guys can um, see that. And, um, and that's where we're gonna take off from. So wanted to share that book with you. Uh, we'll point out lots of reasons why, but one of the most important things um, about the toys in play therapy are, I'm just telling you right now, simplicity, and that they allow for children to be creative. So that being said, it's not a stick, it's not a box, it's not an egg carton, none of those kinds of things. So <clears throat> uh, let's do a little bit of an introduction first. So like I said before, um, that, uh, I'm Jody, and I have Allison with me. I have a PhD in counselor education and supervision, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor in New York State a nationally certified counselor. And the last two things, I have a lot of uh, letters after my name here, but the last two are probably most important for this discussion. I'm a registered play therapist at the supervisor level through the Association for Play Therapy, and I'm a child-centered play therapist master, which means that I can train people to become play therapists and also train people to become play therapy supervisors. Um, so we're doing this through the Counseling and Psychological Services uh, Department at SUNY Oswego. And then I have Allison with me, who is one of my students. Yeah. And um, Allison is working on her uh, child-centered play therapy certification through the National Institute of Relationship Enhancement. That's Naira. And she is a school counseling student currently. So anything else you want to say about yourself, Allison, before... We go get get further into this um just that there's a lot to play therapy but um if you're interested and kind of just looking into it or learning more about it um keep going because there's <laughs> there's a lot to it and it's great okay you love it 
Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so do I. And so that's why after like 25 years of doing this, I still feel as enthusiastic um, and have no problem reading a book to adults. So um, it becomes part of who you are. So I'm so glad that you're along for this part of the ride, Allison. So um, Allison's going to really act as like my sounding board. And so she's going to help me in case I forget to tell you guys certain things or post some questions that maybe beginners would have. Um, we really look at this as kind of as an introductory beginning um, piece of, the, of play therapy is just knowing what toys to have in your space. So we're going to talk about that in a number of different ways um, throughout um, our time together. And we'll, one of the things is, is when you're talking about toys and play therapy is you have to talk about some other aspects of the work. So when we're talking about some other aspects of the work, we're primarily coming from a child-centered philosophy. So, the, so some of the things that we'll be sharing here with you wouldn't exactly fit if you were using um, other forms of play therapy. But most of what we talk about today um, certainly um, it coincides with child-centered play therapy, but also with other sort of um, humanistic forms of play therapy. So just so you know that. So I wanted to talk, start off talking about um, the why behind what you will need. So it's important to know why you're going to need the toys that you're going to need. It's not kind of haphazard where you can just like think about um, like, oh, these are the toys I like, or um, these are the toys that are left over from my kids, or <laughs> um, these are the toys that got donated to me. Certainly, you'll be able to use some of those things, but it is a very purposeful endeavor. And so I want to talk about that. So um, in play therapy, three things are going to happen. And this is regardless of why a child is referred and really what kind of um, theoretical orientation or approach you use in play therapy. And those three things are aggression, regression, and expression. And so because those three things happen regardless of approach and regardless of why a child is referred, is you want to have toys that allow children to um, get connected to that, get connected to aggression, get connected to regression, and, get, and um, have toys that allow for expression. So we'll show you some of those and talk about that a little bit further. The other thing that I, um, another lens that you can look at that through is the five types of toys. And you'll see that these really um, could be enveloped in the aggression, regression, expression part. They're just parsed out a little bit more. So um, if you want to look at it through that lens, you could have family and nurturing kinds of toys, scary toys, aggressive toys expressive toys and pretend and fantasy toys. And so obviously you can see there's some overlap there. Um, and we're going to talk about um, those kind of toys. But the why behind what you'll need is that you want kids to be able to communicate, right? That's what happens in play therapy is they're using play as their communication. So you want them to have the necessary tools, which are the toys, to do that. Anything, any questions or anything else I should be talking about right now, Allison? Not with this, I don't think, no. Okay, that, all right, because we're just getting started. <laughs> so, okay. So next up um, is it just, this is a very basic toy list. And um, the, like I would say these are, it's, it's hard to say like this, this is all you need, or this is like the foundation of what you need. But I really wanted to give you some of the basics and talk about why they're the basics. Um, so some of the basics are um, blocks, and I want to make <laughs> I want to make some recommendations here too. Um, I would say wooden blocks are okay, but just recognize that wooden box blocks can be thrown and that that would hurt if you got hit with one or it might destroy something else in the room like a window or a mirror or something like that. So I um, much uh, prefer the foam blocks. Um, the other thing with foam blocks is they last a really long time and I am not even exaggerating that I've had a set of foam blocks for over 15 years. So they last a really long time. They hold up and you can get them wet. Um, and that's something you can't really do with wooden blocks. Also, you'll see on the market, they make those cardboard blocks that you can kind of, they're really sturdy and you can put them together. But um, I find that a lot of children 
are very interested in taking them apart. They almost look like there's something inside. Um, and then, so they don't use them in the same way that they, that they of course, some kids do, but the way that they traditionally would use blocks. Um, do you, you recommend a size for blocks? I think you want an assorted size, assorted colors, um, you know, for them, really what blocks do is allow them to, it's the expressive part, right? It allows them to create what they need to create. And, you know, one of the things that was on the last slide was, you know, the aggression, regression, expression, is that a block, that blocks can allow um, play in any of those realms. So a block can be an aggressive toy. They can, you know, pretend it's a gun or a sword or something like that. A block can be a regressive toy. They can pretend it's a rattle or a baby bottle. Um, and obviously, an, and, and in both of those cases, an expressive toy. So it can be both and. So blocks are really an amazing thing to be able to have in your therapeutic playroom or therapeutic play area or on the go therapeutic play uh, kind of thing. So did that answer your question, Allison? Yeah. Yeah. So just a variety of blocks sizes. Yeah. yeah. I, um, and here's the other thing is like, I, I don't, I don't think you want to overthink, you know, any of this, you can find a basic toy list like on Google, on Pinterest in almost every single play therapy book they have one. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what some of the basics, you know, traditionally are and why, because I think sometimes you'll see these like a playlist, um, toy, <laughs> play therapy toy list, but you won't see the why you have it there. So, um, so I wanted to talk about that part in particular, um, but also give you some ideas about um, the kind because that does matter. And the next, um, the next one on our list, a ball is a perfect example. You want a squishy ball. <laughs> you want a pla like a plastic ball that will bounce or a Nerf ball. You don't want um, obviously a lacrosse ball or a hard softball or a baseball or something like that. You want one that even if it's thrown um, hard is not likely to harm somebody or destroy property. Um, you heard me say that same thing with blocks. And part of the reason why I'm teasing that out is because um, you will have to set limits in play therapy, but you don't want to have to keep setting limit after limit after limit. So if you can minimize some of the limits that you would set, otherwise you're like, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, is that um, that can be connected to the toys that you choose. So, um, I, and one of the other really cool things about having a ball in your playroom is that um, it is such um, a metaphor and symbol for uh, relationships. So oftentimes the kids are going to want to have a catch with you or roll a ball back and forth with you. And that's just like, I want to be connected to you. I want to be doing something with you. So um, a ball is a great thing to have in your um, playroom. Um, so there's a couple of things that would fall under the more expressive toys here, or washable magic markers. I'm really specific about washable ones um, because I don't want not washable ones because kids will write on lots of things. Um, and, some, and you know, you can try to, li again, limit that behavior, but they can be really quick. And so you don't want them writing on if you have a traditional chalkboard in your playroom or you don't want them writing on their clothing or your clothing or you know the desk or anything like that so having washable magic markers is a really good idea as well as washable paints um what i would say around both of those things is that again i, I want you to be also be thinking about limits and how that could add to the room so um Washable magic marker, even though it's washable, um, it's not on porous service surfaces. So like if a child took a washable magic marker and wrote all over their face, um, that's not going to wash right off. They're still going to have shadow of that and that kind of thing. Um, that might not be a huge big deal if you're seeing them in a community practice. But if you're seeing them in a school, Allison, <laughs> and they return to the classroom. <laughs> No, it would dis it would be disruptive, and you and you know you de definitely don't want that to happen. Um, as far as paints go, what I will say is if um, you find that paints are too messy, even if they're washable, don't even have them in your playroom. Um, I'd like you to have them in your playroom, but if 
if they don't lend themselves to either the playroom or the setting you're at, or if you're traveling, or if you're doing home-based play therapy, um, you don't have to have them. As long as you have some other materials that fall under the expressive and the more art medium style um, toys, you're fine. Okay. Um, a tea party set, a traditional tea party set's lovely, but you do not need a traditional tea party set. And like a ball, a tea party set is a, um, can really lend itself to relationship themes in um, play therapy, but it also um, has like an, that nurturing aspect. If you remember it on the five types of play therapy toys, um, the tea party set has that nurturing um, piece to it. Um, like I said, you don't have to have an actual tea party set. You could have a couple paper plates and paper cups and some spoons, you know, like you don't um, have to go out and spend um, a lot of money. The other thing that you should just think of, and I might be saying this again later, so forgive me, but maybe it's worth saying more than once, is you don't want toys that are super expensive because toys will break and toys will get dirty and toys will get lost and toys will get taken um, from the playroom. And so if you know, if you're really like, this is the tea set that my grandmother gave me, it's been passed down for generations, do not bring that into your therapeutic playroom. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't have so much of a connection to a toy that if it gets broken or dirty um, in some way, shape or form, that that would not allow you to be present in that moment. Um, I'm going to group a couple of these together, farm animals, dinosaurs, um, yeah, farm animals and dinosaurs, I'll put group, put together. You want like little figures that kids can manipulate that, um, you know, are, that are many, they can be many of, so they can set up communities and that kind of thing, families. Um, it's nice to have dinosaurs and farm animals or any other kind of jungle animals. It doesn't really matter, but because that allows for one degree of separation. So um, maybe the animals are mad at each other and they fight and that's easier for a kid to show you um, than the parents are mad at each other and they fight. Um, so having that one degree of separation with some, especially small figures where you can have a whole bunch of them, um, that can be very helpful in the playroom as well. Um, I like a dollhouse in my playroom. Um, dollhouse is one of the more expensive things that you can have in your playroom. Um, but if you're thoughtful about like garage sales and um, thrift stores and things like that, you may be able to find a dollhouse. Um, very basic here. Um, you don't want anything like too fancy that will get in the way of children playing with it or have too many parts and pieces um, that will, be, will, again, get in the way of them playing with it. You want them to use the dollhouse, one for the family nurturing play, and then if you're looking through the other lens, they can um, typically show you what I think the way that I think of it. Um, is like they can show you what life is like at home or the way they wish it were at home. Um, they can do that through the house. So that lends itself to that expressive play. I know I've seen a dollhouse um, often that like flips open. So as a <laughs> handle and it flips open, you can keep all the stuff in there. Yeah. <laughs> and that that's really good for being school-based or having to go into kids homes and things like that it makes for easier cleanup so there's lots of re uh, reasons to have a kind like that yeah good tip um a telephone um especially if you can have two of them that's really that's really great to be able to do because a lot of times um you know phones are uh, metaphors and symbols of communication and so again you have opportunity for kids to be expressive um, they can even be regressive or aggressive um, nurturing all of those kind of things through the telephone I have found like over the um, years that that has been one of the most important toys in the playroom because of the way that um, I learn about children's lives um, so for instance I worked with this little boy who was um, abandoned by his parents and every single session he would go over to the telephone and be like, mom, dad, 
and then he and he was really little like four and then he'd be like no one's there you know so he was just you know he, he really was showing me what that's like to you know be longing for them and grieving for them in his little way um i've also had like a sexually traumatized kid have me she pretended to be on the phone with her dad who was her the person who was perpetrating her and then she was like jody get on the other phone and pretend like um and listen in and per and don't say anything and then she like confronted her dad on the phone and had an outcry um right in the session where she was able to say what was going on and outcry and disclosure so it was super super cool so having phones um in in your um, playroom toy phones is great um you also want a paper in there um obviously if you're gonna have markers or crayons or paints, um, something that they can um, do with paper. Even I definitely have had kids just ball up the paper and uh, use that as a ball. Again, expressive, creative play. Um, the little army men, again, you want like different size figures that they can manipulate. Um, the army men, there are no army women. Um, the army men uh, characters are again super basic and they can create all sorts of scenarios with them so they do have you know per potentially have an aggressive feel to them but a lot of times you're just going to see children use those for expression um, and um, sometimes for uh, like scary play sometimes for protective play so it really can um, stretch the imagination there um, family and people puppets. I'm going to just let you know right now, I'm not a puppet person. So I don't have a ton, ton of puppets in my playroom, but um, lots of my colleagues and people I admire do. Um, I find that the kids don't use them that much with me, but I think that that might be me. <laughs> so, um, but some of the best puppets um, and, the mo and the puppets that get the most use in my playroom are um, puppets that um, look like people that they can like can relate family members to um, this way again they put it on the puppet again you don't have to get super fancy there are beautiful puppets um, just beautiful puppets out there but a soft puppet will do the trick um, in a pinch so uh, if need be that'll work um, Play-Doh and clay, uh, again, um, more expressive type of toy in the playroom. And I think maybe the most important thing I want to say about this is if you are a person who an, um, cannot deal with Play-Doh or clay colors being mixed, probably don't have them in your playroom. And the reason why I'm saying that is because uh, honestly, I know it bothers some of you, and uh, no judgment there. I, in fact, I think um, Play-Doh and clay are outdoor toys, so I'm definitely not judging you if you're like, ah, oh, don't mix the Play-Doh colors. So I have a couple of suggestions. One is if you really, really would like to have Play-Doh and clay in there, but it does kind of like trigger you a bit that um, when the kids mix the Play-Doh, then have Play-Doh or clay that can be mixed and Play-Doh and clay that can't be mixed. And this way you can um, set some parameters around that um, or just don't have the Play-Doh in there. And the reason why I'm saying that is because, and again, this goes somewhat back to limit setting, but the overall, the overall thing is it doesn't really matter what kind of toys you have in play therapy. It's about the relationship. So there are times where I've only had maybe five or six toys because I was doing home-based work or school-based work where I was traveling between elementary schools. It doesn't matter, but you want to be able to have enough toys that they can show you what they need to show you through. If a, any particular toy <clears throat> triggers you, bothers you, irritates you, annoys you, anything like that, when a child starts playing with it, you will not be attuned to them. You will check out. You will get upset. You will not be present. So I rather um, that you just not have it in there so that, that that doesn't happen, so that you can be present and accepting and um fully there for the child and not be like, oh my gosh, that Play-Doh, they just mixed the blue with the yellow. Um, like, I, what that do you was think of, of having the Play-Doh all be the same color? Like if you had four things of Play-Doh and they were all pink or whatever. Yeah. 
yeah, why not, right? Again, you want to simplify this and you don't want you to get in the way. Right. So, um, so that's an, yeah, that's another great tip is to just, then just have one color and you don't even have to worry about it. Um, I'm going to tell you, it's all going to be one color anyway, eventually. <laughs> um, and again, here, you don't have to go out and buy anything expensive. There's lots of good, um, Play-Doh and clay like recipes that you can follow. Um, a doctor's kit is really important, um, for, frequently for nurturance kind of play, sometimes for aggressive play, sometimes for regressive play. Um, it is one of the things that definitely gets used in the playroom the most. Now, um, you can get like a toy doctor's kit, but you can also make a doctor's kit. And by this, I mean, you can get like a tool, um, a plain toolbox or a plain lunchbox or um, even like just like a purse and put um, these things in there. So the important things that I think you should have in there are like, again, simple things, cotton balls, band-aids, um, an ace bandage without the pin clip. Um, all those things, you know, can go in there. Um, craft sticks as tongue depressants, like the um, empty vitamin bottles that have been washed out, of course, anything like that. And a real working stethoscope is a great, great toy to have in your playroom um, because kids, uh, again, metaphorically and symbolically, they can listen to what's going on on the inside. And for so many kids, um, that's such a really important metaphor. And they can also check out what's going on in your inside by using the stethoscope on you. So it's really powerful. They're like $10 to get a real working stethoscope at most you know, regular um, drug stores and super stores. So it's um, not a huge expense and it's totally worth it. The other thing that I will say is a must in that doctor's kit, like I said a minute ago, is Band-Aids. And, um, and <laughs> I can't stress this enough. Um, so first of all, we're really weird as adults about band-aids like we ration them to kids but you can get a box of 200 at the dollar store so um so i will tell you a couple of things one is um, as many band-aids as you put in the playroom will get used so if you put five band-aids in that doctor's kit five band-aids will get used if you put 20 20 will get used so um so i would say to only put probably tops five in there the yeah, other, paper two. yeah, paper too, because, and I'm glad you said that, Allison, because sometimes what the kids do, will, they'll just take like, um, you know, like a marker on the, on every single sheet of paper and be like, well, yeah, just like one little mark. And now you can, nobody else can use that paper. And like, you know, it pushes our sustainability <laughs> uh, button. So, um, I usually do three sheets of paper, five band-aids. That's, that's, the uh, way that I usually handle them. The, what's so great about Band-Aids is, one, is kids know that we are weird about it. So they're, they're like, wait, are these real Band-Aids? And so it already, it's another thing that makes the playroom seem special. Um, and Band-Aids have like magical, in the world of childhood, in the culture of childhood, they have like magical healing qualities. So uh, and I'm not even joking. My son was like probably 12 years old and he had this bruise on his leg and, um, he, and, uh, he was like, Oh, I just, I just got this bad bruise on my leg. And I said, yeah, you know, what happened dude? And he, you know, he said, uh, oh, I fell outside and he's like, oh, where are the band-aids? And I was like, it, what, it's bleeding. <laughs> And he was like, oh, I know, but I still need a band-aid. So even at 12 years old, you know, like that magical healing quality of um, band-aids um, persists. So being able to give kids that opportunity. Um, and also, I mean, one of the things that you have to think about, and it's um, a reason that you're not going to name toys, is that like that kids can use them for lots of different things. So I had um, a child once take um, the stethoscope out of the doctor's kit and he, um, and if I would have been like, oh, you found the stethoscope, I would have gotten in the way of this child's expression and creativity because the next thing he did was he took the stethoscope and he weaved it through his um, the belt loops on his pants and it became his utility belt. 
Um, same thing with band-aids, although most kids will like identify them as band-aids. And then if a child names the toy, then you can call it whatever the child calls it. But um, I've had kids use band-aids as tape. I've had kids um, tape my mouth shut with band-aids when I'm a little too talky, <laughs> um, things like that. So um, you want to just make sure that you're letting their creativity still come out, even if it's a toy that's usually used in a particular way. Um, a camera, mm, um, I, I think that most kids at this point would see a camera as part of a phone, um, but I, you can still get like little throwaway 35 millimeter cameras at like the place like the dollar store or something like that. They use, I will tell you that kids sometimes ask me what they are. <laughs> um, but if you can get a good play phone that also has, looks like it has a camera part of it, that works really well. The reason why you want to have something like that in the playroom is because it's a great metaphor for um, memorializing and memory and the memory of what's happening in the playroom, uh, which is a, a, um, a lot of children do that. It seems to be really important to them. A couple more that I want to talk about here and then we'll uh, move on is, um, you know, really um, great to have a baby doll and a baby bottle in there. Um, I, you know, obviously you have to take some precautions about um, you know, things that might be choking hazards or kids putting stuff in their mouth. Um, with the baby bottle, it's just something that I'm going to clean every single time. But the other thing about that is um, I do put water in my, the baby bottles in my playroom. Personal decision again. Um, sometimes those baby bottles get used as baby bottles. And I've had other kids, especially um, some of the sexually traumatized kids I work with, use it as like an extension of themselves and their penis, right? So they'll like pretend they're peeing on things. So, um, and that's important to them in that moment. Um, it's not something I would set a limit on, but that again, uh, there's all sorts of different reasons to set limits, which is a whole other webinar. <laughs> um, and uh, the other thing with the baby, uh, baby doll, family and people puppets, trying to see if there's anything else really on here, not on this particular list, but I'll talk about it again, is you can weave in, you definitely want to weave in a variety of um, cultural um, opportunities here. So you want to make sure that you just don't have white dolls and white babies and, and um, and that are part of the puppets, things like that. Just be thoughtful about that. The last two things um, that I'm, I'm going to talk about, um, one is the egg cartons, and this can really be any kind of like empty box, really, an empty cereal box. I like to use those in the kitchen, you know, like in like the kitchen area, so they can be used for nurturance and family play, but they could also be destroyed. So if I'm needing to set a limit with a child and like, let's say they dump the crayons out and they are, they're about to stomp all over the crayons, I would limit that behavior. I'm gonna limit anything that's going to harm the child, harm me or destroy property in the room. So if they're about to do that, I would limit them, but then I can offer them a uh, pro, you know, an alternative that would be pro-social. So you can't just, you can't break the crayons because then nobody else can use them, but you can tear up that empty cereal box. You can squish the egg cart in because there's no, you know, there's nothing in there. So you want to be able when a child is being aggressive or destructive or both, um, have something that they can destroy in the room. Make sense? Yep. Okay, cool. And the last thing is a foam noodle. <clears throat> and those are those pool noodles that um, you see around the summertime, or if you live in a warm climate all the time. What I do is, and also they're like a dollar, you cut them in half and now you have two foam noodles that are much more manageable size. Um, these are really great, particularly in settings where you could not have toy weapons, um, because a lot of times kids will use these as um, swords um, or something like that, where they can still de uh, demonstrate their aggression without it being um, upsetting the setting that you're in. So the people in the setting that you're in. So I love using foam noodles for that. I will also say so much creativity comes out of that. So I've had kids use them as a telescope, um, 
frequently as a witch's broom. I've had kids use them as a jackhammer. So or what'd you say, Allison? Horse. A horse, right. All sorts of things. Um, uh, so uh, I think that, again, is an, a really good fling to have in your playroom. And I consider it a basic. <clears throat> again, they hold up really well. So it's like every season I spend $1 on a new foam noodle because they, um, they hold up. So Allison, any questions or anything that I'm that I should fill in um, that I didn't talk about on this particular slide? No, I think you covered it all. Okay, cool. Then let's move on. Um, so I just want to expand on this and looking at the toys in some of those other kinds of categories that, again, they overlap and stuff, but um, I just wanted to give some more examples. Um, so examples of um, family and nurturing toys, some of this comes from that basic list, but then I want, there are some that are going to add to that too. Um, people puppets are, and again, all different shapes and sizes. Stuffed animals, uh, I don't, I, I would say, make a recommendation here, one or two, you don't want it to be like too much looking like, uh, I don't know, like my bedroom did in 1983. <laughs> You know, like you don't want it just to be overwhelmed with stuffed animals. The other things you have to wash those pretty regularly. And so um, I just tend to keep like two in there. Um, it's really nice for them to have stuffed animals in there because they are, you know, like nurturing and cuddly and you know, that kind of thing. So stuffed animals are a great addition to the playroom, but you don't need too many. Play food and kitchen materials. So uh, there's absolutely toy play food, and I would encourage you to have some of that. But there's also kitchen materials that you can have that come from um, that you're just upcycling or recycling. And I, particularly, I like to do that with empty spice containers. So um, wash those out, and then I put them in the playroom. One of the great things about that is. Um, spice and food are so connected to culture. So um, having a variety of smells and food, like the that part um, in the playroom it makes your playroom a much more multicultural experience and diverse experience. So I try. I but we have a we have a wide variety of spices in our home. So we we're pretty good like that. But to just you know if you know somebody who's like oh you always use rosemary can you know? <laughs> in your cooking when you're done with that can I have it um I think that that is something that's it's just a really nice way to bring um multiculturalism into your um therapeutic playroom um and and like I said before empty boxes um of any sort um but you know you can you kids don't always destroy them they can also just be used um in the like the kitchen area so to speak um, okay, so play food and kitchen materials. Let's see what else. Um, sand, sandbox and figures. Uh, um, so I have a bias here that I just want to share is that um, I don't, I honestly don't like to have that in my playroom if, I, if I'm working with really young kids. I find it, it's just really hard for them to keep the sand in the sand um, box and um, it becomes, it, it, it can become a power struggle. It can be like a lot of limits around that. Um, and also the figures are small. So um, choking hazards. And I've had kids put the sand right in their mouth or get the sand in their eyes. So I tend to use the sand, the sand, sandbox and figures with a little bit older kids. Uh, let me give you an operational definition of older. I would say like nine and older. Um, so that's a personal preference for, and also I always want to stay on the good side of the custodians in my building <laughs> and that kind of thing. So it's a lot of cleanup, something to think about, um, you know, with regard to that, but th that certainly would be an example of family and nurturing toys, particularly with the figures that you choose to go along with it. Um, if you're doing home-based, I would not bring sand into your client's home. Again, I just think that <laughs> that, that could be problematic um, in that way. And, and in the schools, um, they've definitely used it in the schools, but um, 
when I'm when I've been traveling between buildings, you can do a small container with a Rubbermaid, you know, like Rubbermaid or Tupperware or something like that with a lid so that it's closed up and easy to transport and you can transport it with the figures right inside. Uh, dollhouse and figures, which we already talked about, and dolls in general. Um, one or two baby dolls, again, just like the stuffed animals, you don't want to overwhelm the space with those. Uh, animal families, so that can be um, jungle animals, sea creatures, zoo animals, farm animals, doesn't matter. And then um, a doctor's kit, which we already um, all we talked about already. So those, if you're looking at it through a different lens, those would be your family and nurturing toy. Anything else there that you would that you thought of, Allison, that could go that would go in that area? Um, for kitchen materials, having like if you are traveling or a shared space or just don't have the funds to get the big kitchen is the really easy like Tupperware container, a yeah. big one, and then like you can draw on the stove, yes, um, and put the toy food inside of it to even use it as. A container piece for that part so because I think that is a really useful um, toy in the playroom yeah so um, all you do is, and again uh, you can find really uh, examples of great examples of how to do this on Pinterest is yeah. you use like a, a container with a lid and you just draw like a burner kind of on top of it like the stove burner on top of it and then now you have that but then you also have a way to um, store your toy, you know, toys and um, travel with them. So it's, it's excellent. I love, love, love that idea. Um, scary toy examples. <laughs> so um, we, I divided these up a little bit. So creepy creatures, I think are an important thing to have in your playroom. You don't need, again, to overdo it. Having one or two creepy creatures is enough, um, but <laughs> snakes uh, are typically viewed as creepy creatures, uh, but in some cultures, they're viewed as healing creatures. So, you know, obviously it depends on how the child is using it. Um, <laughs> rats, we have, one, we, have, we have one that's like a foamy kind of squishy one. It's so gross, so creepy. Um, and, uh, a child that I worked with who had been um, sexually traumatized, like one of the things she wanted me to do was um, eat the rat, you know? And so I, it was like perfect because she really wanted me to know, she's really trying to show me what it was like to have to put something in my mouth, um, which was you know, part of what had happened to her. Um, dinosaurs can be creepy creatures, particularly the carnivore style <laughs> dinosaurs. Uh, alligators or crocodiles, um, sharks, you know, just kind of like the traditional um, creepy creatures. Also puppets and masks would fall under that. This right here, this clown puppet or a clown mask is like literally right out of my playroom. It is the creepiest thing. I wish you guys could see it in like real life because it's creepy here, but in real life, way creepier. Um, part of part of why it's so creepy is this tongue sticks out. So around Halloween time, <laughs> what I would suggest is find one or two creepy masks um, that you can um, have in the playroom with you. A lot of times, children, their view from their perspective of adults is distorted, especially if an adult has harmed them. And so those creepy masks are so important because they allow the child to, show, to you know, give you an idea of what that's like. And then um, these are some creepy puppets here. But I would say <laughs> um, scary puppets um, is that one of the ones I get to use all the time in my um, playroom. And like I said, I don't like have kids use puppets a lot um, is like the alligator crocodile puppet, the scorpion puff puppet, the scarier looking puppets. Um, we even have like a vulture looking one that gets used all the time. So I would say any puppet that you like take a look at and you go like, Ugh. <laughs> um, <laughs> anything like that, that you want that in there. Just, and again, you don't need tons of it. You just need one, like one or two of these things. It's enough for them to convey that to you. Um, okay. Yeah, I had to do that because it's that <laughs> creepy. <laughs> um, so aggressive toys. Okay. 
So in terms of aggressive toys, we've talked about like certainly toy weapons, right? But this this image right here, this is a bop bag. And for those of you not familiar, it's one of those like bags like you punch and they come back up. And uh, there's a lot in the literature on whether or not you should have bop bags in your playroom. Um, I will say this. I like a bop bag in my playroom. Do kids use it to demonstrate aggressive aggression? Yep. But they also, and I think this is so important, and again, part of the reason you don't name toys and you let, and especially in child-centered play therapy, and you let what manifest needs to manifest is I've had this exact bot bag act as a guard that protected a child. I had another child that um, used it as their best buddy. And so they're like, me and my best buddy are going to the park. And it was, this was their best buddy. Um, so it's not only for aggression. Um, and I think sometimes we like, we're putting our own stuff on it. Just be careful about that. So some other examples besides the bot bag would be any toy weapons. Um, I will say that um, if you're going to uh, have um, a, a toy dart gun in there, that the ones like the Nerf ones that shoot um, like foam are way better than the suction cup ones. And how I know this is <laughs> because I've been hit in the face with a suction cup dart gun <laughs> and it hurts. <laughs> so, um, and I like to think that I'm pretty quick in the playroom, but so are kids. So, um, and, and it can be really upsetting to a child when to, to hurt you. So like, I mean, I think that sometimes we think that that's, that they're trying to, but sometimes, you know, like that, um, suction cup toy dart gun will fire and it will hit you and it will hurt you and you'll respond like, ouch and that will be upsetting to a child so because they care about you and they didn't want to do that so um that isn't like an important thing to remember about that you can also have um a toy gun if you're allowed to in your setting and i would check always check about that um first is if you're allowed to have one in your setting, you you don't have to have ones that do shoot anything out the other thing i will say is that um so two things, I always check with my setting. And when I start with a new client, I always ask because people have very strong feelings about guns is I will always ask the um, parent, is it okay for me to keep the toy gun in, in the playroom? Um, I'll tell you in 25 years, I've never had somebody say no, but I still ask. Um, and I think part of that is the community I, that I live in. There's a, is a there's large hunting community. So I think that that's part of it. It's also very embedded in our American culture. So, um, so that's one of the things that I wanted to say about that. The other thing I wanted to say is you don't have to have a gun, toy gun in there at all, because if a kid needs to pretend something is a toy gun, they will. And so whether that turn a marker or a block or their fingers or anything, um, if they feel like they need to do that, show you aggression, communicate aggression through their play, and a gun is a very simple way to do that, is they'll, they'll figure out a way to make one. <laughs> Even this. <laughs> yeah, right? So simple, right? Um, the other thing, too, is that I've had those suction cup dart guns in the playroom uh, where kids have used them as a nail gun to build something. Mm -hmm. um, I had one kid be, flip it over on its like side and, and was like um, pretending it was a boat. Like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I didn't, I didn't see that coming <laughs> at all. But again, uh, it's important not to just assume that they're going to play aggressively, even with a toy that lends itself to being played with aggressively. Uh, swords, um, I prefer to have use the foam noodles than pretend um, swords in there unless you can find foam swords because um, the plastic ones hurt really bad. And I and I have never had a kid like, and again, 25 years, I've never had a kid like try and hurt me with a plastic sword, but um, I get hurt anyway. <laughs> and part of that is um, if in um, child-centered play therapy, if you are doing the style of child-centered play therapy where a child invites you into their play and then you're sword fighting with them, is for whatever reason, that plastic sword will, in, sword, in the sword fight, will hit your fingers and it 
like hurts like nobody's business. And I don't want to hurt the child that way. And of course, and I don't want them to hurt me that way. And they don't want to because it's part of their play. So I would just suggest to either use uh, foam swords or um, those foam noodles instead. And they make rubber knives. And actually, like one of the uh, in one of the playrooms we have, um, there's like a, a rubber axe that I bought around Halloween time that has like fake blood on it that gets a lot of use. So any kind of toy, you know, any kind of toy weapons, but assessing them for safety and your own comfort. Again, if you feel like, oh my gosh, this is like a little too much to put in a therapeutic playroom, then don't put it in there. You don't have to. Okay. Um, toy soldiers, tanks, cannons. Um, we talked about that a little bit when we were talking about the army men earlier. A shield is a really great thing to have in there. I like to have two shields. <laughs> I find a lot of times kids want, if they're engaging me in their play, they want me to be able to protect myself too. Um, fairness is at the heart of the culture of childhood. And so a lot of times they're going to want if they have want something to use, they're going to want um, you to have that as well. It's actually a good sign. It's pro-social. And um, handcuffs. So um, those are probably one of the things that gets used in the playroom the most. Um, I will say that if you are not comfortable with having a kid um, put your hands in handcuffs, just have them again because it whatever it does whatever about it makes you uncomfortable. When you're uncomfortable, you can't listen. So I will let them put one handcuff, one cuff around, but not the other, and I'll pretend. That's one way to do it. Um, also, a lot of times they want to put the, you know, to use the handcuffs behind your back. That leaves you really vulnerable. Um, if you feel safe and it doesn't trigger anything for you, then go ahead and do it. But if you're like, no, then don't do it. Just don't allow them to do it. You can, and the, what you can say is like, I'm not comfortable, just own it. I'm not comfortable with my hands behind my back like that, but you can do it in front or you can put one on my wrist. You know, give them an, give them an alternative. Um, I will tell you that once I had a kid, I'm not uncomfortable. Um, it doesn't trigger anything for me uh, if they use them behind my back. So, but once I got stuck like that, <laughs> And that was uncomfortable, knocking on my colleague's door and asking them to please uncuff me. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. classic moment in uh, my play therapy career. It's one of the joys of being a play therapist. And then I just, I, I had to put this image here because I thought it was like kind of crazy, a peace sign made out of guns, but that was just for an image that I wanted to share. Okay. So really anything can be an aggressive toy um, or not. <laughs> and so again, as long as you have one or two things that kind of lend themselves easily to aggression, um, you've, you know, like check, you've got it, uh, that in the playroom and that's good. Um, so expressive toys, um, here, here's gonna be your art stuff for the most part, crayons, markers, um, easels and, and easel and paints, Play-Doh or clay, finger paints. Um, I don't traditionally have finger paint in my office, um, but, or my playroom I should say, but every now and then I do um, and, or have had in the past. Uh, a really interesting thing about finger paints is they have similar um, consistency to bodily fluids. So um, you'll see that children who have been um, sexually uh, traumatized often have a very strong um, reaction to um, finger paints. So just be prepared for that. If you, especially if um, the kids you work with are part of that population, like if you work at a child advocacy center or someplace like that, um, that, you know, <laughs> what they'll show you because, um, because they may get triggered by the finger paints. Um, you know, I just want you to be like ready for that because it's, it's, um, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty disturbing. So um, all of you will work with sexually traumatized kids, whether that's your specialty or not. Um, and whether the, whether that's the reason the child was 
uh, referred or not. They're just going to, they, they show up at our doorsteps, our therapeutic doorsteps, so to speak, whether we're in schools or doing home based or uh, residential, um, you know, th those kids um, are going to show up for us. So glue and scissors. Um, I have some kids who cannot be safe with the scissors, so I just don't put the, the scissors, I take them out of the room and the kids come in, but there's uh, lots of kids who um, get have opportunity to experiment with scissors. Same is true of the glue. That can be very provocative, particularly for sexually traumatized kids. I prefer a glue stick. It's a little bit easier to clean up. And like the Band-Aids and the paper kind of thing, is they will use that entire thing of glue <laughs> if you leave it in there. So glue stick is a much more manageable way to keep glue in your playroom. What about blunt scissors, like the scissors you just, you just had the rounded edges? Yeah, so those like the kid kind of scissors, right? Um, I think there are some kids that, um, I, that I've worked with who still couldn't be safe with that. Like they would, even though they have the rounded edges, they would take it and like, you know, yeah. try to cut themselves and stuff. So that's just, that's a judgment, clinical judgment call on your part. Um, but most, most of the time, if you're working with I would say elementary age kids and older, they can handle at least the blunt scissors. If, um, if it was a kid who was referred for vi like violence, um, then I probably wouldn't even put the scissors in there. Um, but some of the littler kids have trouble. I mean, they sh as they should, because they don't have the dexterity for it. Right. Okay. Good question, Allison. Uh, blocks are also considered expressive toys and Legos. Um, and so little something about Legos is uh, I like particularly if like if you're in an elementary school setting, um, Legos for the older kids, for your fourth, fifth, sixth graders, they uh, really respond well to that. Um, the other the other thing with Legos is they have some of the sets have teeny, 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 <laughs> tiny pieces. So being careful if you have Legos in your therapeutic playroom and you're also working with real little ones or kids who have pica, you know, or, um, you know, or just um, kids who put stuff in their mouth for other reasons. It's like, um, I, I usually put the, I usually only take the Legos out for the older kids. So if I'm working, I, I work with um, like the youngest kid I'm working with now is two. So I would not even, I wouldn't put the Legos into the playroom. It's just easier for me to keep them out of the playroom and then bring them in when I'm working with older kids. Okay. All right. So I think that we've woven some of these in here. Um, all the lessons that I've learned about toys to in uh, avoid and play therapy are um, have happened in the moment. <laughs> so I'm trying to sh um, to prevent you from that experience. Uh, toy golf clubs are a bad idea. <laughs> so I'm just gonna say they look cute, bad idea. So I, I don't know how else to say that. You will get hit with them. Um, even and I, and I want to be really clear. Like sometimes. Um, you get hit with something, not because a child is trying to harm you, just be because they're children and they can't manipulate it or hold on to it the way that they want, you know, they want to. And so, um, because they don't have the dexterity or the physical development or whatever, and you wind up, or they, they're not good at judging um, spatial relations and you get hit. Um, if you get hit with a toy golf club, it really hurts. It leaves a mark. <laughs> so just don't have them in there. Um, this is a little bit of a different one. Um, I do have puppets in my playroom that don't have opening mouths, but I would say, which is fine, as long as you also have puppets that have mouths that open. And the reason um, why you would avoid only having puppets that mouths don't open is for really concrete thinking children is that, um, if the mouths don't open, they can't speak. They don't have a voice. Um, so that they kind of put those things together. So I, um, it's okay to have um, puppets without opening mouths, as long as you also have puppets with opening mouths. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's some that just like fit on your hand that um, you, you manipulate like the legs and arms and other parts of the puppet, but the mouths you can't open and shut. Right. 
<clears throat> from a child-centered point of view, and I know that some people would disagree on this, but I'm, I'm a purist here, no board games. Uh, out of the playroom. <laughs> and so um, now, can you um, play board games with children and still follow a child-centered approach? Yes. But a lot of the board games that um, play therapists choose are therapeutic board games, which is somebody else's agenda. And if I'm really sticking to the child-centered philosophy, um, bringing in a board game like the Thinking, Feeling, Doing game that or there's an agenda attached to that game. And so that is not non-directive, e even in scope. Does that make sense, Allison? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The other reason not to have board games is, um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm a little on the competitive side. And I found that, um, that sometimes that gets in my way. And so when I'm, I remember playing checkers with this kid and I didn't, um, I've never had board games in my playroom, but this was uh, a shared playroom. And I didn't even know the checkers was in there. And this uh, seven, seven year old boy I was working with goes like, oh, hey, can we play checkers? And I was like, uh, okay. So he gets a checker set up and he illegally triple jumped me. <laughs> And I tried to, I really <laughs> tried not to let it get to me, but I was like, he's cheating. He went, Here's the thing, is that kids are going to cheat. That's one lens to look at it through. They're going to cheat at games. But um, and the way that I look at that is, um, is that they're going to find ways to be successful, right? And so all of us find ways to be successful. And um, they're just it's not usually very graceful when they're playing board games. So for some of us, it's the cheating that bothers us for, um, or if they lose pieces or if they play differently. Like um, if they're playing Monopoly, I know the way my, the way I was raised in my culture was there's a, you get, there's $500 on, under free parking. Did you play that way, Allison? No. <laughs> okay. So right there, like right there. So if Allison and I, even as adults are playing Monopoly, we're going to have a power, potentially a power struggle over whether or not you get $500 when you land on free parking. Okay, so I just think it's easier to leave the board games out. Just leave them out. They come with too much connected to them. I know there's lots of great board games that are therapeutic. I know there's lots of great board games that can help uh, connect us to children like Uno and Jenga and feeling, playing feelings Jenga. And there's so many cool things that you can do. Um, that's fine if you're not doing child-centered play therapy to like it, to its truest orientation. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, um, if you're watching this and you're like, oh my gosh, that Jody Mullen is so strict about the board games. I am, but I'm not. I am if you're doing child-centered play therapy. Um, I'm not if you're um, doing something called like humanistic play therapy. So it, it kind of depends. Um, things with sharp points. I think that's kind of a no-brainer. Broken or dirty toys. Um, broken or dirty toys convey that we don't care. So um, dirty toys also can, I mean, Broken toys can also have sharp points or um, things like that. Um, so they can be uh, dangerous, but like um, having toys that are really like mangled or dirty conveys that like we don't care enough about the space and our things. And we don't want to, um, we don't want a child to think that that also applies to them. What are your thoughts on like, if you're able to fix a toy, like if something snaps off and you're able to glue it back without it, you know, being seen or noticeable? So if it happens outside of a session, you mean? Or, or if it is broken in a session and then. Yeah. Fix okay. It. okay. So two things. So sometimes like a leg will snap off of a doll or something. Right. And, um, okay. So two. I'm really glad you said this, Allison, because sometimes you'll see a kid will break, a toy will get broken by accident um, in, a, in the playroom, and you will see a child have a really um, visceral reaction, like that they'll go like, like they'll think you're going to yell at them or 
um, harm them or, you know, whatever. So one of the things that's really important to, to, to say is that like toys break, you know, <laughs> like, so, some, right. so if I notice that kind of reaction in the child, when they break a toy, like, <gasps> um, I will say like, you were really worried. I was going to get mad. I'm actually going to reflect on what's happening in the relationship. You were really worried that I was going to get mad, but toys break in the playroom all the time. So making sure that, um, and just a quick funny story is I had a, um, in a, in a graduate level play therapy class, like the one you're helping me teach currently, is I had a student who was probably at the time in her 30s break a toy during a practice session and she was beside herself, beside herself about it. So, um, you know, so I, I just, I think we really need to be observant um, and attuned to how kids feel if a toy breaks in session. Mm -hmm. Okay. That being said, if I can snap the leg back on that, I might say like, let me see if I can snap the leg back on that, especially right. if they've asked me. Mm -hmm. um, but if a toy breaks in session and, and, um, and I think I can repair it, of course, I'm going to give it a try. Um, but at some, you know, also at some point just saying like, I, this doesn't look right or it doesn't work right. the same way. Yeah. I've actually had some kids, you know, over the years be attracted to broken toys um, for various reasons. And I've like kept, like I've kept them for that kid's session. Like um, I had a baby doll, <laughs> his head popped off. And every, every time he picked it up, like the, after that, if that happened in a session, um, the head would just roll off. And this one kid that that happened with, like he thought it was the funniest thing ever. And so at the end of the session, um, he said, Oh, can, can we keep that? And I was like, yeah. So, um, I didn't keep it in the session for the other kids, but you know, for him, uh, I did. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are. I just thought of this, um, for toys that maybe like, like you said, a leg is missing. So I think of my brother who, who has one leg uh -huh. uh, and how that would like represent him. Like if you were to go in and see that, yeah. Um, for other people with physical disabilities that might um, connect to toys that have pieces missing. Yeah. So I think, I, I think there's just a thoughtfulness about that. Like, does it look like a broken toy or does it look like um, that can be purposeful or it could be, you know, a child might be attracted to that. I uh, told a story in class a couple of weeks ago um, where um, I had a Barbie doll and it was one of my favorite toys when I, was growing up at a Barbie doll who got her legs stuck in the escalator <laughs> and, um, and it was a compound fracture. So her, bar her Barbie doll, her Barbie doll bone was sticking out and yeah. I loved her so much that I did not want to part with her. And, um, actually my dad like bandaged her up and I kept that Barbie until I said goodbye to all my Barbies. So, you know, I think just, uh, again, you're assessing for how a child responds, um, but but to just, um, I think more of the spirit here is I'm not going to go to like collect a bunch of toys that are kind of on the yucky side or broken right. and use those as my play therapy set. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any toys that break easy for kind of the reason we were just talking about a lot of, you know, um, you don't, you won't, don't want to have to keep replacing them. Be replacing them and the other thing is you also don't want um, the kids to have that happen because for so many of them especially in the relationship with you that can be really kind of like taxing on their system so um, you don't want to have toys that just like just break super easy uh, toys with too many small pieces choking hazard plus the pieces get lost like you know it just becomes yeah. a hassle you can have battery operated toys, um, but then make sure your you keep the battery in it, like an up to date, um, or never have a battery in it. So, um, so you have to make a decision about about being able to do that. Um, I tend to not use battery operated toys at all in my playrooms because I just can't like it's like another thing I have to think about. Um, the other thing is frequently battery operated toys they put the expression in the toy rather than the child puts the expression in the toy so um i have a good example of that okay. actually in Go one ahead. of the practices um in our class i use the cash register as a computer 
Mm -hmm. but if the cash register had the sounds and everything that might have an impact on the child using that for something else. Perfect. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. So that's why I either stay away from battery operated toys or I just, um, I just don't put the batteries in at all. Um, you know, if you look at like Axline's original work, um, you know, one of the things that she really stressed that was also stressed in my training and my education um, in terms of becoming particularly a child centered play therapist is simple, simple, simple in terms of the toys. And once you add battery to it, it's not so simple anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you always want to think of safety, of course, in terms of toys to avoid. And also you're going to have some kids that just don't, res that respond really negatively to a particular toy. And for those kids, I might just take the toy out of the playroom. Like I had one little girl who was like really afraid of, we had this Elmo doll in the playroom and she was terrified of it. So I would just take it out. Right. So the logical safety piece of it, you recognized and made that right. step. Yeah. So it's not just physical safety. It's also psychological safety. Um, and I'm so glad that you said that because that just triggered me something else is like, uh, there's no need to have anatomically correct dolls in your um, therapeutic playroom. And I'm saying that as somebody who specializes in working with sexually traumatized kids, they will show you what they need to show you whether or not those dolls have the correct anatomical parts. So um, that, um, and there's, there's research on that. You can look that up. If you um, don't agree with me, then have at it. Um, but I'm telling you, you don't need that in there. So, um, and then I, I also thought it would, um, makes a lot of sense for us to just talk about some considerations. I know we've kind of been weaving them in here and there, but I wanted to make sure we talked about um, these as well. So um, I will say that if you go to um, Integrative Counseling Services YouTube page, you can find an entire <laughs> uh, free webinar on home-based play therapy and the toys that we recommend go along with that. So I'm just going to send you there rather than um, say a lot about that here. But um, when you're doing home-based, where you're traveling to children's homes to do the therapy, um, play therapy there, is it really just has to be things that are um, easy to travel with and easy to clean up. Um, so that's like the, probably the most important part of that. Um, but again, there's a whole webinar already on Integrative Counseling's uh, YouTube page on that. And it's free. So um, <laughs> bonus just like this one. <laughs> so um, uh, also school-based. And Alison, I'm going to let you be the expert because even though I've done school-based um, play therapy, um, is that like, what are some of the things that you're, that are, are really kind of important to think about because you're doing that now in school-based play therapy? Right. Um, so one of the things that comes up a lot for me is my location. So like where your office is, um, it's right next to the principal's office and also the attendance. So many people are on phones talking with parents and if a child were to be, you know, swearing or yelling or even doing something that just creates a lot of noise that can have an impact on others that would take away from um, the session. And then me also being like, oh my God, like that was so loud. Um, right. So keeping that in mind and then being um, prepared to set a limit in that sense. Yep. Um, and then. So um, you can have um, toy musical instruments maybe in that office. Right. Right. I, yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> or or um, something that made like, like a toy gun that made shooting noises. Mm -hmm. Right. I right. think that would be a foolish toy to have anyway, but particularly in a school setting. Yes, definitely. Um, and then, uh, another piece with the weapons is, um, like the army set that I have is actually, there's a lot to it. They, they have little guns in the army set itself. Um, and they're not like big. So I feel like there's a degree of separation there in the sense yeah. of like, it's with the army guys. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just the foam noodles. Otherwise yeah. I, I wouldn't really have any other weapons, um, okay. out in the room. Yeah. Um, and then the other, the, uh, like a positive about school-based is all the kids, like the kids have to go to school. So you have <laughs> all the kids there, um, right. and it's not like someone had to come in and make an appointment. So, um, like the 
just play therapy being a great um, approach for working with kids um, of different cultures. Yeah. So yeah. that just in itself is like a great way to just interact and provide therapy for kids who are of different cultures. Yeah. So not letting that get in your way. And there's enough research out there. You can really get into the weeds on it um, in using school-based play therapy and in, in using play therapy with kids from all sorts of um cultures across the planet, you know, um, and one of the things that Gary Landreth said, who's our modern day uh, child centered play therapy guru is Gary said, um, it's not if you use play therapy in the schools, but how, and so it's just, you know, some of the things that Allison has been saying about being thoughtful about that. And, um, I would recommend, uh, Athena Drew's book on school-based play therapy. Um, I think that you, you know, that there's a lot there's a lot in there. Um, that's enough to get you feeling confident about bringing play therapy into the school. Mm -hmm. um, play therapy on the go, I, I include play therapy on the go here be, um, because I think home-based play therapy, school-based play therapy, and even agency-based play therapy all can be play therapy on the go, which has some it has some things to think about with it, um, is that you have to be able to pack it up you know, um, a lot of us are not in just one location where we go into the room, the room we use um, or the space we use is not designated. So um, I think like when you're thinking of play therapy on the go, one of the things that I think can be really helpful, and this would be true for home-based play therapy too, is having like a sheet or a blanket um, that designates the area of the room, right? So that if you're doing play therapy in the middle of a child's living room at home, it's not the room that's special. It's just being on that blanket. It creates sort of a container or a border. Um, and that can be true doing school-based work. Um, and that can be, um, you, you know, true if you're going from building to building that you have a mat or a blanket or something like that. Um, that also works well with um, shared space. So I'm jumping around a little bit. And by shared space, I mean like I need to use this part of my office for my computer and my paperwork and, you know, that kind of thing. And this part of my office, I want to do play therapy in. And so having something that designates the boundary of play therapy, I think is really important in doing this work. And so, um, so thinking about like in, in terms of the sharing the space is what can I have in my office that's easy to clean up if I have a parent meeting right after or um, something like that. But being able, I have literally put um, tape down on carpet or tape down on flooring and kids will not crawl across it if you set strong boundary and if you don't waver around that. So I find kids super responsive to that. So if you have shared space, where, um, and I don't mean sharing with another person, I mean um, space that you have to share with other um, things that you have to do, that that's a good way to do it. Um, and then <laughs> limited space um, is that some of us don't have really big playrooms, big, beautiful playrooms. Um, one of the one of the schools that I did play therapy in, I'm not even exaggerating. The room I had was a closet, and it was four by five, uh, four foot by five foot. And so, in just thinking of that limited space, I didn't need, I didn't want any large scale toys in there. So, in that room, I didn't have a kitchen set, which is one of my favorite things to have in the playroom. It gets used all the time. I just had like a, a little teeny tiny barbecue set, um, you know? So, so just thinking of limited space, you don't want it to be overwhelming to the child. So um, being, you know, thoughtful about like um, the number of things you have. And as long as you're hitting one or two in all those five categories or one or two of aggression, regression, expression, you're in pretty good shape. You don't have to have everything. Um, there's some, I do a lot of supervision, so I've seen some of the most, I think, beautiful playrooms on the planet. And um, the, my playroom is not one of the most beautiful playrooms on the planet, but here's what you learn, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. it, toys are just an opportunity for a child to help children communicate to you, but it's a, especially with child-centered, it's about the relationship. So, 
Um, some other consideration, cleaning and messes, is if you have kids that are scheduled back to back, um, or if you have to like pack up and go, all those kind of things, how, like what toys are in your room that um, will help facilitate that, right? So if you have, like don't have the 180 pack of crayons, have the eight pack of crayons. Or if you <laughs> do like have a bin that can easily, like you're not sliding them back into the crayons. Right, right, yeah. So that's why the bins and containers can be really helpful too because it's just, I can just take all the Legos and put them back into this container versus having to put them back in a box or organize them in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So bins and containers are really good um, to have. Plus if you're play therapy on the go, school-based, home-based, or share, you know, like moving from place to place, is that's a, a good way to travel with them. Um, also thinking about uh, in terms of cleaning and messes, obviously um, cleaning anything that a kid puts in their mouth or sneezes on or anything like that you have to take care of that I, I don't get any like um residuals from this but there's a product called clorox um it's for hard surfaces and you can just spray it right on um and then you don't have to wipe it down or anything and it cleans it takes you know de disinfects the surface so i really like that for quick cleanup again quick cleanup um that if if need be um but one thing, and again, toys very much wind up as they have this whole conversation being connected to limit setting. And so if I have children scheduled back to back or um, I have to go after, you know, a particular session because I have to head out to another building or, you know, anything like that is um, I'm much more likely to uh, limit the mess making than I am if it's my last kid of the day or if I have the time to clean it up. In child-centered play therapy, children are not responsible for cleaning up the messes. We are. Uh, you know, the mess is, again, a metaphor. It's symbolic of um, what they're going through or what they're in the middle of or that kind of thing. So you just want to make sure um, that if it is... A, if it is um, impeding what you need to do next, that you just set some limits around the messes. And usually the limit that I set, because you have kids who, um, I just refer to, was, refer to them, <clears throat> excuse me, as dumpers. They'll dump everything, every container you have out, right? And so you have all the crayons, all the Legos, all the, you know, all the kitchen food, everything is dumped out. The, those dumpers is, um, is that I'll just say like if you're if you want to play that way, uh, we have to end session five minutes early because it takes me a really long time to uh, take care of that mess for you. Um, and you know, and for some kids, it's worth it. Um, if you have never done that, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, do it. It's it is so. Um, this is just a quick a quick story is um. We were, uh, so we have on, at the university, we have our like campus clinical play area and we were moving from one building to another. And I had, um, our clinical space has a play area, but it also has like the sand play and the figures, right? So, um, so I had my, uh, one of the students who was helping me move and organize stuff. I was like, you know what, just take all the, the sand, play figures off the shelf and just put, we'll, we'll reorganize them when we get to the new building. So she just took her hand and went like, whoosh, and, and knocked them all off the shelf. And, and, and then she was like, Oh my God, that was the best feeling ever. And she said to me, have you ever done that? And I'm like, oh, God, no. So she's like, do it, do it. So I did it. And I was like, wow that's an amazing feeling so then we, then we went to the department secretary and I said Melissa you have got to try this and luckily we had like six or seven shelves and we just kept inviting we invited other professors in to do it and everybody had the same response being able to create a mess like a swooping mess like that ah oh, it just does something to your system. So if you haven't done it, if you haven't dumped something out, if you haven't created a mess like that, do it. 
<laughs> just have enough time to clean it up. <laughs> yeah, just make sure you have enough time to clean up. Right, right, right. Um, also, you should consider the developmental age of the kids that you're working with. Some of you will work with, you know, from two, like I do, from two year olds to 12 year olds. And so you want to just make sure you have toys that are appropriate for the whole span developmentally. But some of you are going to be working with more narrow age, um, like some of you will only work with preschoolers. So you can be thoughtful um, in that way too. And of course, there's a lot of diversity among preschoolers, but still, um, you would need less diversity in terms of the toys you have in your playroom if you're working with just preschoolers than if you're working with two-year-olds and 12-year-olds. And then uh, cultural considerations, make sure you um, you have dolls of color um, and puppets of color. And they even make markers that are different um, for different skin tones, uh, Crayola makes them. Um, also, like I had recommended spice, the different empty spice containers. Um, look for different uh, ethnic food, like, you know, not, uh, food boxes that you can put in your playroom, but also um, eth different ethnic items in terms of plastic food. It's much, I can tell you, it's much, much, much better than it was 25 years ago when I started, but um, you, it still should be a, thought, a thoughtful practice and procedure. Right. I actually had two things that I want to bring up with the messes. Okay, One good. Of them, um, was a story that you told, but first, just really quick, paint markers. Um, I think are a good way, like if you still want the paint to incorporate them. Um, and then also this thing called Modelite. You have it right there with you. Huh? You have it right there with you. That's yeah, I do, because I use it. Um, so, you know, because clay is really, it can get, like it's wet and it just doesn't um, work well all the time um, for schools and just between sessions. So nice. that is, it dries. Um, and so the kids could also like, depending on what they make, they could keep it. And it wouldn't be like, oh, it has to stay here to dry. Right. Um, and then also a story that you told once, and I'm wondering how um, it would relate to this in terms of like, if the kid has a mess on them, like their hands um, and having a wipe, like kit, like hand wipes in the room. Yeah, um, yeah. And it relates to also giving an opportunity to be like, hey, ask, like saying, is it okay if I help you wipe off your hands? Yeah. Thing. Yeah, so it, um, I think that I forgot about that. So that's why I, that's why I have you aboard, Allison. Um, <laughs> so thank you. It's like, yeah, having just like some baby wipes or, you know, things that are um, in the room that a child could take care of themselves um, if they had to, or they could ask for help um, in cleaning a toy. They'll use it with the baby dolls or themselves. Absolutely. That's a great thing to have in the playroom. Even um, sometimes just paper towels and water is, you know, um, is enough to do that. That um, becomes a nurturing toy, but it also um, allows them to be demonstrate their pro-socialness. And I think that's what, you know, I think one of the things that happens when you talk about toys is oftentimes you talk about the anti-social ways children will use toys. Again, um, I'm going to say that my experience is like, you will get much more examples of children finding pro-social ways to even use toys that are typically antisocial or thought of as antisocial, then you will have the opposite happen. Um, so I think that like that is important, um, you know, to know as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Trying to think. Oh, this is uh, here's just my contact information. Uh, there's a foam noodle. See, I told you. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is my contact information. Um, if you're interested, and there, um, there is more. Uh, you know, I was thinking of this as we were like wrapping up that last slide. There definitely is more to toys than we're you know talking about. Um, it, you know. You know, but I think a lot of it is woven into some of the other basics of child-centered play therapy. A lot is woven into limits. A lot is woven into themes. Um, and um, we're going to include some, if you're interested, some ancillaries um, that will help you see how those things are connected. Allison um, created one really cool one about toys and themes. So if you're interested, that would be, um, you would contact me through that email address and we'll send that out to you. Um, yeah, so what else, Allison? Um, 
do you want to mention any toys that weren't on the basic list that you find are used oh. really often? Yes. Um, I want you to say, what are the two, um, the, you know, how long have you been doing clay therapy? Like a year? No, not a year yet. Not uh, even well, year. I guess, well, I started in September. Okay. So you're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what are the toys that the kids that, um, that you work with, like, what are some of the things that you're like, oh, I don't even know how I'd ever have a playroom without this in here? Um, cars is something that has been used quite a bit, even for like escape like a vehicle for people mm -hmm. to be escaping or being involved in the play of um, aggress aggression. Yeah. Um, and then also it's not a toy, but a bean bag. Yeah. I find it to be really great in terms of um, even for laying on, sitting on, using as an alternative and limit setting for hitting instead of like, if you don't have a bot bag, which I probably wouldn't in a school. Right. Um, I find that to be, and even the sound of it, like with the beans, yeah. the, like adding that piece to it. Um, and then, dress up clothes, not having a lot, but like a cape and a mask. Um, the combination of that I found to be used. Yeah, I, I would, I would definitely agree, um, about that. Um, sometimes like, I, I think sometimes you just want to also think from a sensory perspective too, is like, okay, what different sounds and feels and things like that are in the playroom. Um, at my, like I think I said earlier, like I got to have handcuffs in my playroom. Mm -hmm. I also have to have a jump rope. I love a jump rope in my playroom. Um, it is, I can't even uh, think of all the different things that jump ropes have it's been. It's actual rope, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I'm thinking yeah. of the only ones where it's like plastic. Yeah, no. and <laughs> yeah, those ones stink. The, the actual jump rope, because they'll use that. I've had kids use it as a snake, as as uh, waves in the ocean, as um, lasso, to sh as a lasso to show competency, to tie themselves up, to tie me up, to tie us together. You know, because they don't, let, you know, because they're creating uh, like um, the, an, a bond. You know, there's just a million ways that um, they've used the, the lasso. I think you can see from this picture lots. Of, I, I do love my dress up stuff in the playroom. <laughs> Yep. You know, it's weird. I'm like wearing almost the same outfit right now that I am in that picture. Besides, <laughs> besides I mean, I have the boots on. Besides, and the, glasses and <laughs> besides the glasses and the kerchief, it appears. Um, I also love a uh, magnetic dartboard. Um, I like uh, there sh I do think there should be toys in the playroom that allow kids to be successful. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, we talked a little bit about board games earlier and that kids will cheat. They'll cheat. Uh, adults will cheat. Look at the research, you know, <laughs> um, like if given an opportunity, I think it's like 96% of, of college students will cheat on the test. Right. Like it's classic. Right. But, um, but um, I like to have things in the playroom where kids can feel um, successful and a jump rope can, you know, ap absolutely do that. Um, or, you know, allow them to feel competency. Um, uh, another thing that I really like in the playroom is something like, um, it gets the cash register gets used every single kid. There's not a kid who doesn't use the cash register and the money, mm -hmm. um, that goes along with it. And, um, I like, like, um, in one of our, therapeutic playrooms we have like a toy vanity that has like a pretend blow dryer and a curling iron and that that gets a lot a lot of use as well I so, can imagine. yeah so I again I don't want you um just like you want kids to be creative in the playroom um you can be creative too about what you include in your in your playroom it shouldn't be expensive it shouldn't break easily it shouldn't be dangerous um and it should for allow aggression regression and expression it's you know so within that there's so many different ways that that you can go with that but we really just wanted to, to give you a, a foundation for that and um we'll inc we'll include the link for the home-based play therapy uh webinar and toy list that has a toy list that goes along with it that um of things we recommend for home-based play therapy and then um if you're interested in ceus um or you're interested in um, Allison's theme and toy um, challenge is um, we will be happy to send those to you. All you have to do is email me and let me know that that's what you're looking for. So.
last words, Allison, anything? I don't think so. That was great. Got yeah, that, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing your expertise and proof that like you can really become um, super knowledgeable about about play therapy and in a in a short time like Allison has but she has uh, really dove deep so <laughs> so thank you again Allison I appreciate you doing this with me yes thanks for including me <laughs> oh welcome I